we're gonna I'm gonna bring up Sneha Viswalling again. And she's a staff test automation engineer at Zoll LifeVest in Pittsburgh. She started her career in the field of test automation in Silicon Valley, where she got opportunities to learn and grow in the field of QA. Her interest lies in topics like continuous testing, testing in machine learning projects, software operations, tests and infrastructure automations, agile, regulatory. Um, she likes to, to blog, speak at tech conferences and create videos related to testing and professional development. Uh, she also teaches high school kids how to code through the Microsoft TOS K-12 program. So I'd now like to bring up uh, Sneha. You could go ahead and sh share your screen as well. I'll turn off mine. Thanks, Tim, for that amazing introduction. Can you see my screen? I can. Awesome. So um, welcome, everyone. And thanks, Michael, for that amazing presentation. It was, it was really good. And um, welcome, everyone, to this talk on... Uh, Managing distributed test infrastructure using Selenium Grid, Terraform, and AWS. And before we move on to this, I just want to get a quick, um, you know, uh, show of hands on um, how many of you have. Uh, wait, before I go to that, how do I see that? Just a second. So I have a list of the particip participant view over here. Uh, so how many of you? Um, run your test automation in a nightly scheduled build kind of uh, infrastructure. Can you raise your hands in the participant chat, like in the participant view? Okay, I see two hands. Awesome. Now if you can clear that, the next question is how many of you um, have more of a continuous testing and DevOps approach with uh, continuous testing in place with Infrastru using infrastructure as code and uh, some things like that. Awesome, I have so many hands up. Cool, thank you so much for that. Now you can, you can clear that, cool. So, you know, at this point, uh, you know, at this point uh, with, with DevOps and continuous testing, really modernizing the way we release software, it's, it's more important to have more test coverage to, you know, make important decisions with faster feedback. So, to design that, that kind of solution uh, that supports that, we need a scalable, manageable, and cost-effective, most of all, uh, kind of infrastructure. So in this talk, we're gonna discuss a little more on that topic. Um, Tim already introduced me, but uh, if, if you'd like to get in touch with me, the best way would be on uh, Twitter or LinkedIn. I also blog on my website, it's called snehavishwalingam.website, and I just started creating some YouTube videos on uh, you know, talk, talk about software testing and professional development stuff a little bit here and there. So today, uh, in today's talk, we're gonna start with talking about the evolution of uh, test infrastructure. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about infrastructure as code, understanding uh, infrastructure orchestration tools and understanding configuration management tools. And then a little bit about, you know, that uh, distributed test infrastructure workflow. So to start with the evolution of uh, distributed test infrastructure. Back in the days, uh, it was easy for anyone to just spin up the Selenium server on a spare machine under the desk and call it a day. But now, you know, times are changing and there are so many moving parts and um, that, that all need to be really effectively managed. So let's take a look at how the evolution of test infrastructure has been since the beginning of the introduction of UI automation uh, using using Selenium. So first, you know, in the beginning when it was just introduced, it was basic test automation execution as and when it was needed, sometimes even in a person's laptop, right? Then, uh, because at that time, the focus was actually on just automating, like adding some automated checks uh, to avoid repeatable tests to reduce the testing time. So the attention was not so much on the infrastructure, but the, so the approach was very naive and we probably used to automate the tests and uh, we ran them as and when needed to speed up the testing process as such. And then uh, we started going into the executing test automation in the nightly scheduled builds with an intention to get a report when we come back next day to work to see uh, the health of the builds uh, of the previous day, right? So it was, it was mainly uh, just, just for us to get to understand if something, if something um, broke the pre in the previous day's bills. So as, as the number of tests kept increasing, we started to have a need for distributed testing 
Uh, so the need for distributed testing arises when you know you have a lot of tests to execute in a limited amount of time, and then you have uh, to test the application in different browsers and different OSs at the same time parallelly, and then you want to reduce some time execution so that you know they can it can be run frequently or to be triggered or even after merge requests or any any changes to the repository that's being made. So. With the, with the need for uh, distributed, distributed testing, and around that time we had um, the introduction of Selenium Grid, uh, which, which you know, really allows the execution of web driver scripts on remote machines by uh, both virtual or real remote machines by routing the commands sent by the client to the remote browser instances, right? So it solved a subset of uh, common delegation and distribution problems but it did have it, it does not for example you know manage our uh, infrastructure and things like that so, so one still had to update the drivers in the browsers in the nodes and we had to take care of the maintenance ourselves so at that time uh af like around that time was the so 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 then we uh, started executing the test execution with selenium grid uh, so there are more than one way to do this right so many organizations would immediately start thinking about creating a lab, manage, lab managed on premises or in the cloud with virtual machines. So this approach actually worked well in many places, but for other organizations, this may have been more of you know cost prohibitive approach or it was slow to spin up or it was difficult to maintain. So these were like some of the pain points that came along with the introduction of uh, Selenium Grid. So around that time was also the introduction of uh, different SaaS solutions. Uh, so many companies like Sauce Labs, Browser Stack, and you know Lambda Test. And if I didn't mention any of your favorite services, please don't be mad at me. These are just some examples. So luckily, you know, at that time, these were introduced to tackle that kind of problems. These are mostly like cloud-based services, which which kind of provides environments for testing with Selenium, Appium, and sometimes even produce gives some uh, manual execution, some space for even manual execution. In, in their in their cloud so with these you know you got all the combination of environments with with versions and browsers and devices that that one needed for testing so for companies that had uh, highly confidential data like hipaa hipaa constraints and uh, banking related information they had they had options for having secure connection um, that made it a very viable option for them but obviously that also came with some cons which could which could be you know, related to cost, since there's amazing customer support and uh, there's no maintenance required from our end, it came with the cost. And uh, as the tests keep increasing, the cost could considerably increase as well. So, at the, and moving into the cloud also started to look like a, a very uh, attractive option for people because you know, uh, migrating an in-house Selenium, like Selenium grid to the cloud makes automated testing of web applications independent of the physical infrastructure. So this kind of eliminates the need to purchase and maintain devices uh, to test them on. So Selenium Cloud also provides like high availability, which reduces the risk of downtown. So moving to the cloud was becoming a very trendy thing. And a lot of people uh, were looking at options to move to the cloud. And you know that gave rise to a lot of DIY solutions for people uh, to, like ar architects were coming up with their own solutions if they didn't you know, uh, go, go with the choice of buying an off the rack solution uh, to, to run their test in the cloud. And then came, you know, the rise of DevOps culture and continuous testing uh, and the modernization of the cloud infrastructure. So at this point, you know, one of the steps for DevOps to be really successful uh, became adding continuous testing to their pipeline because Continuous testing would mean that you're testing often, testing everything, and testing throughout the pipeline. So this also means that you know we need a scalable test infrastructure, which is also cost efficient and reliable. Because if this is not taken care of, if if continuous testing uh, is not is is really causing a bottleneck by not uh, not being very efficient, and people may sometimes you know lose patience if your testing stage is taking so much time uh, to, to give feedback and to give results, that's really gonna slow down the entire pipeline and the people are gonna lose patience. So we don't want uh, testing to be a bottleneck in the process, right? 
so so that is that is uh, that is one time when infrastructure as code um you know the introduction of infrastructure as code in uh, the continuous testing world was uh, really something that uh, that was super cool i think and now now what is what is infrastructure as code right it's the it's the process of provisioning infrastructure using code without any manual intervention that can be versioned and tracked using source control so it is basically writing your infrastructure as code um and and that really helped uh, you know in in um, and that really helped having a sophisticated test environment that is that is needed for continuous testing so when we talk about you know some of the infrastructure as code tools some some tools that come to mind are tools like terraform cloud formation heat ansible salt stack chef puppet and others right now we it's it's while we work with them it's it's important for us to understand the difference between infrastructure orchestration tool and configuration management tool now what is infrastructure orchestration tool so these are tools that can actually provision the servers and infrastructure by themselves like for example uh, if you if you're using aws right uh, this the tools that can actually help to provision ec2 instances in aws right those are those are the infrastructure orchestration tools and uh, some examples of such tools are terraform and cloud formation because these actually help us to build the servers themselves whereas the configuration management tools now these are the tools that are designed to install and manage software on an existing server so what that means is if you already have an ec2 instance in your aws then a configuration management tool will help you install and configure uh, whatever application or software you want within that already existing ec2 instance so that is more of a configuration management tool now tools like ansible chef and puppet these are all examples of configuration management tools now while while using these two tools it's important to understand that you know um configuration some configuration management tools can also do uh, some some level of infrastructure orchestration for example ansible can can help in also creating ec2 instances in aws but you know some of the best practices when it comes to devops is to use the right tool for the task uh, so if if a, if a tool is is known for configuration management uh, it's it's best practice to use that only for configuration management and if a tool is best best used for infrastructure provisioning then you know it's it's best to stick to that and use it for that and you can use a combination of both of them in the system to to realize whatever we want to fulfill so the next thing is about you know choosing the infrastructure as code tool so when we want to choose our tool what is uh, some of the questions that we have to ask when uh, we decide which tool is the best for us right now the first question to ask will be uh, is is the is our organization like does our organization have a long term vendor specific infrastructure like for example i can give you an example of you know suppose your company is completely using aws and they've decided that this is the approach that they're going to take and this is what they're going to do so maybe using a tool like cloud formation which is specific to only aws would be a good option for you you know and the next question would be is it a multi cloud or hybrid cloud based infrastructure so if you know that you know your company uses two three different clouds for example if you use aws azure gcp you have so many different clouds that you're going to be using or maybe you're not maybe you're using only aws now but you have future plans to use different clouds so if you want to keep that option open then you would use something like terraform which is a multi cloud which is more of a hybrid cloud solution and then uh, if you if you need to integrate with configuration management tools so, so some tools integrate better with conf other certain kind of configuration management tools so if you know that you have a certain configuration management tool that you want to use then you know these are some these are some uh, questions that you can ask to really decide which tool to choose for your organization for the solution that you are coming up with and then the cost is definitely uh, a major factor for anyone while choosing a tool and the customer support as well is an important factor while trying to understand which tool to choose 
So um, talking about this, right? Let me show. Let me quickly show you how um, the different tools work like. So this is an example of uh, cloud formation, right? So if if you are going to be mostly in an AWS based environment, uh, cloud formation also like these are all these are tools that the the companies really make the tools very easy to use. For example, if you want to. Uh, provision and um, EC2 instance, you can just drag and drop and it you know, automatically creates the code over here. And then if you see um, Terraform over here, Terraform has so many different providers. Um, it has like so many different providers and tools that it has integration with, which is why it's more uh, preferred for a multi-cloud or hybrid based infrastructure. If you see it has, um, it goes with uh, GitLab and GCP and uh, OpenStack, and there's so many, so many different options available over here. Uh, and it's it's easy to learn as well. If you go to the learn section of it, uh, they actually show you all the different ways that you can get started with the cloud that you are interested in. Um, and then the documentation is pretty good in the Terraform website itself. Next, uh, let's talk a little bit about Terraform. Uh, so Terraform is, again, we mentioned that, you know, Terraform supports multiple platforms. It has hundreds of providers and the configuration language is pretty simple to use. Uh, there's not a very deep um, learning curve uh, in trying to learn the language. And it has very easy integration with um, man config management tools like Ansible. And it's also easily extendable with the help of plugins. If you see the website, they have a number of plugin options as well. That's that's mentioned that that really works well with Terraform. So the next thing that we want to see is, you know, kind of trying to understand how all of this fits together. Now, for example, right? Um, let's let's take this basic steps that we want to do. So the first thing we want the Jenkins uh, to really trigger the build, and then we want uh, to create an EC2 instance, and then we want to install and configure Selenium Grid into that EC2 instance. And then we want to return that IP address of the instance to feed it to the test suites, because that's gonna be the IP address of the grid, right? So that has to be fed to the test suite so that the test can go and run the, uh, the test, test, can be, uh, test can run over there in that, using that Selenium Grid IP address. And then after the test is run, we wanna destroy the EC2 instance. Okay, so this is this is kind of the process that uh, we are interested in, that that we are looking at. So um, let's take a look at you know how to how that that really looks in the workflow point of view. So over here on the left hand side, you have the Terraform config file, which which has information to go and create an EC2 instance in AWS and install and configure Selenium Grid inside that instance, right? So once, so once you apply uh, apply it via the Terraform, right? It'll interact with the backend provider. In this case, the backend provider is uh, AWS. So it goes in and it asks it to go create a new EC2 instance. It creates the EC2 instance inside AWS, right? And then depending upon that, a new EC2 instance will be created. And once it creates, the message is returned back to Terraform and it gives it gives a Terraform the IP address. Okay, I created an EC2 instance, here is my IP address, take it. Now Terraform integrates really well with configuration management tools like Ansible, like we mentioned before. So Terraform will now take that IP address and give it to Ansible and ask, it'll ask Ansible to go ahead and um, install the install and configure Selenium Grid, whatever method we're using, to go and configure it within the EC2 instance. So now after all of this is done, Terraform will send the message back that you know all things that you define in your configuration file are now completed. So you know uh, this so this is like the basic workflow that we are trying to accomplish in the pipeline, right? Uh, we want so when we want to run our tests, we want to create an instance, and then we want to create our Selenium grid, and then we want to run our test, and then we want to destroy the instance that we created. So that way, we are making it very efficient and less cost because uh, the, the instance is not always on it. We're just creating it and destroying it as in when required. So we're only paying for what we're using. 
So the next, um, so the next level, right? This is just to rehydrate, right? So first the gen kids creates it, Terraform apply, and then Terraform creates the EC2 instance and Sybil installs it, and then it sends the IP address to the test suite and then it destroys. So here we can see that you know infrastructure itself was created as code. It was so easy for us. We didn't have someone to go in manually and um, you know configure all the different things, and uh, we didn't have to put in an IT ticket and wait for IT to get back to us. And you know uh, we we just we just went ahead. We added it in the pipeline, and uh, we we source control the code. So it's it's described even if someone else is coming. Uh, to the team and you know if they want to take a look it's all there in the code so you know it just it just makes the entire process so efficient and so easy and um, so well executed as well now these are just examples of the of the different combinations that we've used but one can get very creative and use use all the different a uh, number of different tools that's available uh, according to the needs of the team right so these are all diy custom options which which we will configure according uh, to, to what is required for our team. You could have auto scaling, you can have so many other options um, according to the number of tests you have and according to the number of environments you have. Um, so, so yeah, you can take it from there. Now that brings us kind of to the end of this talk on, um, um, you know, some to summarize what, what we looked at, if we, uh, using using infrastructure as code really makes infrastructure more reliable and scalable, and it actually gives an opportunity for developers and testers to create an environment as and when needed to even uh, test features in isolation if they have to. And then the code that describes the infrastructure is version controlled, and um, uh, the code is integrated in the CI/CD pipeline itself, and it happens in a fraction of a second. And it doesn't really become a bottleneck in the testing process. Testing should never be a bottleneck in the in the pipeline. That is that is really our aim to make that process as smooth as possible, uh, at least from the infrastructure point of view. Now, how how we add, what kind of test cases we add in continuous testing, that is that is a completely different topic. But at least from the infrastructure point of view, we don't want um, we don't want any bottlenecks to be caused, right? It, it shouldn't infrastructure shouldn't take time to spin up like it, it shouldn't take like five minutes to spin up and then 10 minutes to set up something it should all happen within a seconds so that you know the process is as quick and efficient as possible and then the next step to make continuous testing more efficient would be on the choice of the test cases that we add that we add based on the business risks and things like that so, uh, and this this also considerably reduces the infrastructure costs. So, that is uh, that is also another reason why adding infrastructure as code uh, really um, has given to uh, the evolution of uh, test infrastructure. So that is all I had. Thank you so much for being a wonderful audience. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah, there's there's one question from Faisal. So he's asking, can you provide any specific benefits of 